Okay, well, thank you all for joining us today for Tara McLennan's Media Futures Hub seminar on photography as becoming networked um, memories. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people um, in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, elders past and present um, and extend my respect to any First Nations people who are joining us um, today. It's a, it's a um, beautiful day today and uh, um, around here. Um, uh, and I'm very thankful for the country that I'm on. Um, I'm, I'm also really pleased to be uh, um, chairing this talk because um, I first met Tara when she was doing her PhD um, uh, at UTS um, at, a, at um, a seminar on creative practice work. Um, and I was immediately impressed by how smart she was, how warm she was. Um, and, uh, and it's just been a delight to have her join, um, to join us here at UNSW. And, um, and I'm really pleased to, to be able to, um, you know, uh, introduce her and, uh, and, and um, chair this session today. So uh, Dr. Tara McLennan is, McLennan is a lecturer in the School of the Arts and Media um, here at UNSW. She recently completed a PhD um, that explores how networked smartphone photography mediates personal memory and the experience of the present. And her re research interests include new media studies, philosophy of photography, film studies, and memory studies, which she pursues via creative, creative practice um, research um, uh, through autoethnography, experimental histories, and ficto criticism, and I think we're going to hear um, a bit about that today. Um, after um, after Tara has um, has given her talk, we're going to hear a response from um, Edgar Gomez Cruz, and that will then be followed by uh, discussion. So, uh, Dr. Edgar Gomez Cruz is a senior lecturer um, in media at UNSW, and he's published widely on a number of topics related to di digital culture, digital ethnography, and digital photography. Um, his research interests span from everyday uses of digital technology, and he uh, is also interested and uses ethnographic approaches, and he's interested in methodological innovation and visual interventions. And I could not imagine uh, a more perfect um, respondent for Tara's work. Um, so thank you all uh, very much. And um, I'll hand over now to Tara. Tara, take it away. Thank you so much, Michael. I um, really greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here for Media Futures Hub and to share this conversation, have this conversation with everybody. And thank you, Edgar, as well. Um, it's very exciting. Um, I am speaking from um, Gadigal land at the moment. and. Um, it's interesting to begin a talk about how we situate history within the present from that perspective. Um, I'm starting to open up questions about the past, not as something uh, in a linear sort of chronological time that's behind us, but that is actually co-present with the future that we are creating. So I hope, I hope to see it become something more in that space in Australia. Um, so let me begin by uh, sharing my screen. Just let me know if there are any technological issues. Um, I'll just set this up like so, so I can, there we go. How's that looking on everyone's end? Is that okay? Excellent, good. thank you. Okay, great. So if we are here to talk about photography, then we begin, of course, with some photographs. Um, here we have a couple of images, uh, both taken at the same location, one in 2005, one in 2013 at the Vatican. As you can see, one is a smattering of light, a real reflection of the ubiquity of smartphone technology, which is part of how we mediate our everyday. It's um, part of streetscapes, it's part of home spaces, it's around the globe 24 hours, it's mapped through satellite coverage around the globe, pin dropped in time and space, and it generates an atmosphere of almost instant accessibility, or so it seems, where everyone everywhere seems a part of this photography, which captures experience as image. 
um, there are approximately 2 billion, it's probably a little bit more now, um, smartphones in the world. And every 24 hours, just under 400 million photographs go up to Facebook and Instagram. That's 800 million to Snapchat as well every day. So this is partly why the image behind me is here. Um, someone asked at the start, are you sit sitting in front of a pile of rubbish? Um, well, it's a good question. Um, this is from the artist um, Eric Kessel's exhibition where he printed um, 24 hours worth of Flickr photographs in an installation for everyone to move through in space. So it's interesting to think about the experience of images that are still in a moving screen, in the glow of your smartphone. It seems to be an endless bathing of light, um, light that keeps you awake at night if you look at it for too long. Um, and there's light uh, flickering all around the globe as everyone winks at this or that that they have to catch in the moment. So how does that situate? in relation to other forms of photography that we have seen. So in the beginnings, photographic light meant something very different. It came with more discourse around darkness um, and more material relationship with darkness. The camera obscura was a pinhole camera where a little shrill point of light had to make a trace through the black like a wound. It was an intensity that burnt through. You could think of it as a pin, a cut, a burn, a shot. Some of these are the words that come out in writing from theorists such as Roland Barthes, who wrote extensively on analog images and their temporal signatures. Um, he talked about the punctum, which many of you would have heard of before. Um, but uh, I'm going to concentrate on a particular aspect of it, um, which is the punctum of time. That is, when you look at an image, you are exposed to the multiplicity of time, to the overlap of past and present in the one encounter with something, um, with a shot. So the way he wrote about it was in relation to an earlier version of this photograph. This is obviously an Instagram reproduction, tinted and recolored, of a portrait of Lewis Payne, who was on death row um, in 1865. And Roland Barthes looked at this famous image and said, I read at the same time, he is about to die and he is dead. This will be, and this has been. And that is the punctum of time, the coexistence of temporalities, or the return of something absent as a presence. Um, it can be a really sharp taste of loss. He described it as something that brings the distant past suddenly into the moment. Um, and it suspends something that you think is gone with you. So, my question has been, where is that sense of temporal signature in what's now described as the enduring ephemeral of online images, Wendy Chun's expression? So I'm coming now to one particular type of image amongst the flood, hashtag sunset. When you think of all the little phones in the evening that wink at the sun going down, you might think, well, on the one hand, this is a kind of image that could testify to um, light on the brink of darkness, loss in other words, a departure, uh, a volatile star that's burning with the duality of life and death or with that statement, this will be and this has been. On the other hand, it's a trope, it's a hashtag. There are so many suns suspended on our screens every day thousands of them from around the globe. They never seem to go down. They do not sink. Here we have one that I picked up in my research. Uh, was annoyed that my phone didn't work when I wanted to take a picture of the sunset. 
I'm comforted to know that y'all had it covered anyway. So thinking about that, I, I started to question what it was to experience a singular wounding trace of light amidst this abundance. Um, is it possible to be overexposed to that digital luminosity and to be numbed to something that has the punctum of time? I should say that I come to photography as many of us do now in a way that has multiple modalities. There are many photographies at the moment. Um, my childhood is the dusty boxes in an attic um, of envelopes with Kodak prints from the 24 hour shop. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram. I had a look at how many photos are stored on my phone yesterday. The latest update is 9,270 photos plus another 343, which haven't been saved on the cloud because I've run out of storage. So it's strange for me to think about what loss means from my own personal experience with this medium. It's a medium that for my family has inscribed our relational history with losses, with the endless slippage of time that constantly produces and erases itself. Um, very intimate family albums, such as the one pictured on the right. And if I look at the rush of Instagram images in my feed that slip across my screen, I start to wonder what the presence of absence means here. What could be an intimate and vibrant exchange with loss? I've used digital autoethnography partly to position myself within these multiplicities of a medium, multiple assemblages of photography. Um, I'm embedded in uh, a practice, in many practices and, and networks that cross the public and the private, um, that cross different materialities and different historical cultural ways of situating what a photograph is. Um, so digital autoethnography is my way to tap into the sort of temporal experience of encountering images in their context in an assemblage. So I think about um, walking down the street and I sort of catch where images are being taken. I snapshot things on my phone. I'm trying to create a sense of movement, the movement of photographic experience, a writing that can, as Kathleen Stewart would put it, describe something's qualities, trajectories, duration, or to follow how things accrue or how they lose steam. Uh, in the process, uh, you know, I, I am perhaps in a hunt of sorts or have been on a hunt, a desire to capture something, which in the end has ended up just mirroring what I've encountered in photographic practice around me, an ongoing need to mediate or orchestrate a relationship with transience. And my urge to find the singular image doesn't lead me to one image per se, it ends up just exposing me to that desire in and of itself. Um, so sometimes when I'm exposed to the sort of forces of temporality that come out through the enduring ephemeral and through photographs, my awareness of transience, of time as a big sweep uh, is um, strikingly brought to the forefront in a flash. Uh, it happens very quickly and unexpectedly sometimes. So I'm drawing on Walter Benjamin's term here of the historical form of knowledge and aesthetics of the flash or what he described as a moment in time where it's not that what is past casts its light on what is present or that what is present casts its light on what is past. Rather, what has been comes together in a flash. So 
in all that searching and all that hunting, there are these little moments like finding a uh, camera, um, a smartphone uh, case such as this one, um, which has on it a very famous, one of the very famous earliest images, um, the Boulevard du Temple from Louis de Guerre in 1838, a photograph that had to be exposed very slowly. And as a consequence, with all that light seeping in, it looks like an empty streetscape, but it's not. You just catch in the image one man bending over to have his shoe polished and another man reading a newspaper, but they're like dusty shadows. Um, so strange to see the presence of absence there to cover a device that is going to be used to hashtag upload stream heighten presence and visibility. So I guess I bring this in here to say that the histories of the medium are not chronological either. They come together in strange ways. They coalesce in strange ways. Um, and Jeffrey Batchen writes that um, photography is in fact a medium that continually returns to haunt itself. Um, and I've certainly encountered that. So I, I put um, different um, moments from the medium together in dialogue to see what sort of trajectories and tensions I can find. But I'm also thinking about happenstance and the personal in the mix there too. So um, the punctum goes well with this idea of the flash. It's an affective happening on a personal level um, that spirals into being without notice. It's what Bart would say is a roll of the dice, an accident which pricks me, just comes out of nowhere sometimes. And those moments are significant for pointing to the fact that despite the fact that a single image appears to be still, appears to be fixed, every photograph contains with it a sense of the enormity of time that has come uh, before, after, that overlaps it with meaning. Um, and this is where I come to the idea of duration. A uh, concept from Henri Bergson, this notion of time as non-chronological, as ceaseless, um, the past which coexists within the present that it has been, and at each moment time splits itself into present and past, present that passes and past which is preserved. Um, Bergson would call it where the, the form of being where we're in our states melt into each other. We actually can't pin drop, you can't identify or isolate a moment as um, self-contained or separate from all the other experiences that it emerges from. Um, and that relates to some of the ways photographs have been described. Um, Susan Sontag writes, all photographs testify to time's relentless melt. So perhaps delving deeper into the personal side of things to write about, what does it mean to write about sensing this temporal signature in relation to personal loss? Um, it's curious to go back and look at writing about photography and memory um, that's analog because you get a lot more of the sort of personal account, biographical, autoethnographic when it's analog. And Roland Barthes is one of those people. He wrote Camera Lucida. And for him, the image that struck him most was obviously a photograph of his mother after she died. And he calls it the Winter Garden Photograph. And he said, I decided to derive all photography, its nature, from the only photograph which assuredly existed for me and to take it somehow as a guide for my last investigation. All the world's photographs formed a labyrinth and I knew at the centre of this labyrinth I would find nothing but this sole picture because it was wounding, because it spoke of time in a certain way. And it said 
um, here is this woman. Uh, she's in the photograph, a child. Uh, she is his mother. She's gone. He is her son. He is an adult orphan. He is not yet born. All those times are entangled in that encounter with the image. And so he says, I can't produce this image for you in the text. I won't display it for you. It exists only for me. For you, it would just be an indifferent picture. Nothing really, just ordinary. Um, I think it's curious to think about this now because um, the choice not to reproduce an image because it relates to loss is quite interesting in this, in this moment. Um, it's a very different way of thinking about what visibility means or it prompts me to question how I might work with visibility if I'm thinking about loss and photography. Um, there are a lot of demands often placed on this medium to um, testify to things. The, originally, it was the pencil of nature. It was, it's been a witness as well. Um, and nowadays, we perhaps see versions of this kind of demand in the ways photographs are, are brought out of uh, the database to say, look at what this person did at this point in time and let's hold them to that moment and fix it there. So it can be quite uh, an exposing glare to look at an image that perhaps for the person who is intimately connected to it, it means one thing um, and that can't be known by others. So what's a way of looking for singularity that isn't going to be exposing others to a really acquisitive and uh, inquisitive kind of gaze? Um, is there a different kind of gaze that won't reveal um, the photograph's secrets, but allows us to know that the photograph does have secrets? It's more than what meets the eye. Um, so if we go back, um, light, light is some kind of testimonial to truth. Obviously, this has different resonance depending on which moment you look at it, but it comes up again and again in the history of the medium. Um, in 1882, the photograph was lauded as the best kind of witness. Its light stamps and seals the similitude of the wound on the photograph put to the jury, so but the medium can be more reliable. There are still ways of talking about photography online that perhaps combine with dataism where there's this sense that everything must be available. It comes through in this statement from Daniel Rubinstein and um, Katrina Sluice, everything, every moment, every location is registered. We can now truly say that we can see everything. We know everything. Information is ubiquitous. At the same time, we have a lot more theory coming in that's about the materiality, the non-visible uh, material context of the image as a trace. How does a trace mark a beholder in ways that can be unseen, where light is intimately connected to space and time, connecting someone to something from their history? Um, beyond what can be seen, beyond what's visible. What do grief and photography illuminate in one another? Um, how can we move beyond surface matter to so think about that respectfully? Um, I came across a really interesting exhibition. Um, Florida-born artist, actually it's not an exhibition, it's, it's kind of, it's an online website. Uh, Florida artist Jason Lazarus has drawn together uh, anonymous vernacular images in a project he calls Too Hard to Keep. And basically it's an archive um, which he asks people to contribute to. He calls upon anyone who has an ambivalent relationship with photographs that wound. And the subjects and owners of these pictures, if they don't wish to keep, but they also don't wish to lose what has been caught on camera. They can give it to him 
and he will put it in this art archive as a repository for images so that they may exist without being destroyed. For the most part, um, there's no way of determining what the potency of these banal snaps is for their owners. They don't come with written description. Um, many of them are uh, smartphone related, as you can see. Um, and many of them are what you would term banal or nondescript. But for somebody, somewhere, they matter and they need to be given a space. So the photograph invites a response to the losses that it holds in its pregnant trace of lost time. How can you think about it as something that you don't want to deny, but you also don't want to put under a glaring light? I'll begin with a photograph of mine and I won't exactly reproduce it. Um, it's a picture of an adolescent girl and she's asleep in bed. And at first glance, it's entirely unremarkable. It's just a casual family snapshot. But something dormant stirs in me in this encounter, in the exchange between image, the moment that I'm looking, the moment that it was taken and myself now. That's me at the age of 18 when I had chronic fatigue syndrome. And it looks like just one second, but it's actually four years of my life. Um, it's a neuroimmune condition that distorts the brain signals running down the spine. Um, and that was an illness that really uh, disrupted my relationship with who I was in time and space. Now I think about Bart's writing that he didn't want to reproduce this image, but I come from a different position here. Um, I have to think carefully about what visibility means for a memory such as that. When it's the body of a woman, it's my body and it's related to an illness that does get stigmatized and an illness that also renders people often invisible in some ways. So I wanted to seek a way of engaging with photography that could neither deny that that was there, but offer it a generative space. So the flash is an aesthetic I've been exploring. Here she is in flashes in a, write, in a sort of photographic writing that says, look, but do not see, it's not on the surface. Um, and gives it a bit more of a generative force, I hope, um, allowing the search to say that the surface image won't yield its interior memory matter. Okay, so. The flash here is thinking about light, not as an evidentiary glare. They're little sharp takes from the image, not recognizable, but the heat from the image is there. It's not something that exposes, but it's still not something that denies. And it's there as a form of disruption to how the image would appear in the live feed, where it would just be part of flotsam and jetsam, uh, it would pass by. So I'm playing with concealment and revelation and thinking about those images, which normally we put in maybe the box that goes under the bed and it has an affective heat to it. But in the ephemera of the internet, what does that mean? So light as something that a flash that goes off, but it brings with it a sense that you've seen something not visible, you've experienced something um, that the photograph is blind to. Um, 
I don't want to fix her in place. I don't want to say that she's trapped in time. And so why do I bring up her picture? Because autoethnography is about destabilizing the boundaries between self and other. There's an ethical side to it. So when I'm going out looking for what photography means, I have to be very sensitized to the fact that a photograph that looks meaningless to me could have this heat behind it for somebody else and that it might be an experience completely unknown. Um, so to tread lightly, to tread gently and to acknowledge that there's no last word on any image. And fixity is an interesting thing to follow up here. Fixity is something that has been with photography ever since before it was announced publicly as official. But when it was announced as an official medium, it was very much about finally catching and holding time in place. Um, Daguerre's public statement, I have seized the light, I have ceased its flight. Um, and photography came to be known as a mirror with a memory. On the left-hand side, we have an image I found of a daguerreotype for sale. And as you can see, this is one of those moments where two different times meet because the person who posted it is reflected in the glass. Her smartphone is reflected in the glass. Um, so the daguerreotype was a mirror with a memory. It could hold a transient reflection of the subject still, keep something that was so liquid, uh, tame, capture it. Um, now, what is fixity now? It's very different. The abundance of images online that rush through with 24 hour time are of a different kind of order. Media theorist Andrew Hoskins calls the swift and fleeting glance at the dissipating past memory on the fly in which the unfolding details of daily life have a once through quality in which the mundane and the momentous actions and events of people's lives carry them forward, even as the continuous present seems to slide relentlessly into the past. So perhaps this is not the mirror with a memory. These new glass photographic devices are a mirror of the now. And photographic light is always moving. So, the history is there, an association with mortality, an association with fixing something because um, life is short. Um, and contemporary scholars battle with this, how to frame this. Uh, Joanna Zielinska and Sarah Kembra write that they, they seek to wrest photography away from its long-standing association with mummification and death and to show its multifarious and all-encompassing activity or its liveness. Um, Meta Sandby posits that photography uh, no longer belongs to the realm of the disappeared past. The, the temporal signature of the image is this is now, not this was. So you start to see sometimes a, a binary kind of language emerge, life, not death, present, not past. And there are disagreements, of course. Nathan Jurgensen writes, in the age of digital abundance, photography desperately needs an introduction of intentional and assured mortality so that some photos can become immortal again. So what's being dealt with here is, again, those desires to try to understand what the mediation of transience is. And um, David Sutton says that this is something that's been happening not only in theories about photography, but in how we photograph um, from the get-go, that photography has always been a really strange contradiction. He writes, it's life in memory, in the present, within death, the dying moment, the silent dead past. 
and that the history of the medium is a continual grappling with those forces. Um, so sometimes uh, we can see um, the, the grappling of those forces coming out in the interesting design choices of platforms, the shifting affordances, which change so often. Here we have a little example of something that has changed. Um, but on Facebook, the earliest version of Facebook um, was experienced as without a timeline. It had your home page had all this information, all these images that were described by um, some of the stars on Facebook at the time as uh, everything falling off a cliff. It just kind of kept moving so fast and so much. Retrieval became an issue. So how are they going to bring something back? Um, they introduced the timeline and the first design feature, the first way it appeared was this long thin blue thread. I don't know if you remember, the thread is now gone, but it would connect between one photograph and the next. And it was meant to give a sense of linearity, um, chronology, um, everything mapped. But as with any kind of experience of information on your home page, it was very slippery. And um, the experience of it is like a Sisyphus um, process. It's just you roll down and suddenly the whole screen is populated with more time and yet more time. Uh, you're just continually moving and moving and wondering, you know, how can this continually accumulate and seem to reproduce itself? Um, so they got rid of the blue line um, that links each moment to moment. Perhaps there was something a little bit disquieting about watching it uncoil ceaselessly. If you waited, if you were very, very persistent or you could get to the bottom, where you'd reach this little baby icon, born, and you could add a photo. And of course, this experience, which was meant to create a sense of fixity and ended up creating a sense of uh, fluidity, made me return to Duration and Bergson, who writes that life is lived like the unrolling of a coil for there's no living being who does not feel himself gradually coming to the end of his role and to live is to grow old. But it may just as well be compared to a continual rolling up like that of a thread on a ball for our past follows us. It swells incessantly with the present that picks it up on its way. So I have seen the navigation of this coil uh, recently um, my father started putting together uh, photographic albums from the chaotic uh, dusty boxes of our attic shortly after he was diagnosed with a very slow burning form of lymphoma. And in his ritual process of assembling, curating, pinning things down, he was looking for a way that memory could be shored up be materially fixed in place. And he used a form of super glue, which is called elephant grip. Uh, and my mother did not appreciate this. <laughs> so there was some tension between them. Um, she doesn't have that same relationship to images. She likes to allow whatever losses are captured in photographs to be left to be, um, not to stick them down, not to locate them, not to make them pinned in any way. Um, so she saw dad's selection as having a very tenacious grip and resisted it. And so for a while, um, his little ritual stopped. Um, they were at an impasse. Uh, in disagreements about what should be kept, what should be forgotten. 
And in their disagreements, I pick up on a tension that exists on a broader scale in the uses of smartphone photography, a push and a pull between a story as storage and as something fleeting, something that can be washed away. Um, and obviously I'm starting to think about Insta stories and Snapchat and these kinds of features that began to really revel in the disappearance of the photographic image, the unfixity of it. So I proposed to my dad, you know, how about um, we put together, we'll finish your album, but we'll do it with a difference. Um, we'll try Insta stories. And I explained it to him and he said, so where did they go? <laughs> um, and I said, they disappear in 24 hours, they're gone. He's quite nonplussed by this. Um, so he took me up into the attic and we went through all his images on his computer that he'd scanned and that hadn't been put in any album. And I noted ones that had an impact on him and put them into a story, which I then, Insta story, which I then played back to him. And obviously that story is gone, but I can play you courtesy of Shane Anderson, um, who works in the ABC, a small radio clip that gives you a sense of that rhythm that comes from an Insta story that's put together this way. It's when it's images that wound and they slip by, it has a different resonance. My grandfather holding my grandmother tight as she deliberately goes limp in into studio arms. wedding photos. Their honeymoon on a large cruise boat. Amateur shots taken around an Adelaide home. Mm. The birth of two brothers. The family Play dog, Ginger. The in the Lanky adolescents. Hey. Freckle-spotted boys pull faces to avoid the camera's penetrating the gaze. Family dog, Ginger. Yeah, so that's a little excerpt from a radio piece that Shane Anderson put together. Um, now, um, obviously all these images have a different resonance to me and I'm reminded that no still photograph is ever still. Um, these images return to me now that my father has died. So I, I look on them very differently. Um, but the photographic light, that's part of the assemblage that I mean, it just keeps moving. Uh, it keeps spinning, much as all the Insta stories keep spinning with more sunsets, more coffee cups, more pet dogs, more nail manicures, etc., etc. And the kinds of posts like that one about the sunset. I uh, was annoyed not to get it, but comforted that you all had it covered anyway. And I'm reminded of the fact that um, there are different ways to choose to navigate the transients of photographs. Bart would describe this as mad or tame photography. He says that you can choose to embrace the wounding photograph or the potential of photographs to wound if you engage with uh, these images as a form of realism that is absolute and so to speak obliging the loving and terrified consciousness to return to the very letter of time. On the other hand, tame approaches to it are more surface level. You can kind of bathe in it. It's the same kind of approach as flicking through a magazine or scrolling down a screen. It's slippery, but in a pleasant way. Um, it's not so wounding. And so, you know, I think about the number of images that start to look much the same in this endless repetition, sunset after sunset. And you see things like, you know, um, actually I think the way Nathan Jorgensen puts it is interesting. He says that when you see an image such as a palm tree that appears really quickly in the stream, it's often less about that specific palm tree than about palm tree nests. <laughs> that it's part of an expanding visual discourse built on seeing, recording and speaking with the world through its visual sign. And the value is to see the more universal meanings in specific objects. 
So more generalizable, more banal, but signifying I'm experiencing this kind of life. I am living life this way. And that's not at all new. You go back to what looks like the earliest version of Instagram. It's the carte de visite, the first most affordable form of um, photography, which people collected in these little graphs of squares. Uh, you could collect those of friends and family, but you could also collect celebrities such as the queen um, and stick them all together. And they were all about signifying, this is the kind of life that I am living now. Um, claiming ownership of things that were given social value. And I think about the number of times that um, I've seen people rearrange the dinner table before anyone's allowed to touch their food before you know anyone can eat there must be a representable photograph that says it happened this way this is how we lived um so it seems generic in some in some ways repeated but from out of that volume of really generalizable images which are all driven by a need to capture to claim visible ownership um the conditions for something more piercing are still present so here we have uh, in slow motion an image from Facebook of Happy Friends Day, um, where you kind of see a little representation of what you might think of as the assemblage on Facebook. All our photographs intertwined with data, intertwined with one another um, in a network that moves algorithmically. Um, that sweeps by and is curated for each of us through personalized systems, um, the collective and the intimate working together. There's such a volume um, to work from there that we need those sorting systems and the ways they're represented is quite strange. We're all familiar with Facebook's You Have a Memory, all these ways to automate, to bring memories back Tara, we care about you, says Facebook, and the memories that you share here. We thought you'd like to look back on this post from one year ago. And of course, that's all under the assumption that the kinds of photographs are going to be generalizable. They're going to be palm trees that are palm tree-like um, because when it goes wrong it's or it jars, you start to realize this code doesn't account for the, the wounds that are there and it doesn't account for the fact that people do still photograph things when they're trying to understand loss even amidst all these coffee cups and sunsets and so on. So the first time it sort of happens it's it's very strange. Um, the early versions of um, your year in review on Facebook, we see an example on the left, uh, you know, happy confetti, little dancing figures, gifts and so on around an image and some people received images that didn't fit the generalizable image of something calm and tame. Um, for example, this is an image someone received, uh, they took a picture of their house on fire. James, here's what your year looked like. Here is your house on fire. Um, the algorithm is prepared for certain types and tropes, but it's not necessarily prepared for others. Obviously, that's an earlier version of um, the whole process. It's gotten more sophisticated. Google Stories, um, Google Photo is now very sophisticated. Um, and there was this really interesting story on the right, now something I can no longer play because digital decay has stepped in perhaps. This media item could not be loaded, but I have seen it. Um, it's a video of uh, a series of um, still images that were put together for um, Brian Gantz, um, who worked for Vox Media, when he went to his um, grandmother's funeral, um, the automatic system, all these non-human forces started co collating and assembling 
um, a slideshow for him um, without request, uh, where they put together images of his grandmother's coffin alongside photographs taken around the same time of his children playing, um, going to school, the young and the old together in the one moment. And he said, it was a very strange and profound experience, something that he would never have put together himself. But from out of that abundance, there it was, um, death and life together, or what he called a new kind of uncanny valley for digital artifacts. Death and loss are a part of life. And we all have to keep running around and around, forward through the sun. So back to hashtag sun. The light on the screen, the light of photography seems to be without loss. The sun seems to never go down. Um, Penelope Ombrico, an artist, created um, this artwork, which you see here, Suns from Flickr, where she stitched together all the sunsets um, that she found from um, the, the website. And she writes that online, we see a photographic scene that says, we're here, we're here all the time. We're everywhere, forever. And it is in this sense, an eternal, timeless, spaceless algorithm. Things recur with subtle variation as the world spins on its axis and every single photograph experience slips away along with a piece of mediated life. But is it all just repetition? Derrida says that is not time, the ultimate resource for the substitution of one absolute instant by another for the replacement of the irreplaceable, the replacement of this unique referent by another that is yet another instant, completely other and yet still the same. He says that out of repetition, out of sameness, that's where the punctum comes. Without that, it doesn't have the space from which to emerge. And it does emerge. It returns in ways we don't expect um, from out of seriality and repetition. This, the punctum is part of this. Uh, it's never inscribed in the homogenous objectivity he says, of this framed space, but it, it haunts it. So in those endless online streams and lulls, those various rhythms of photographic encounters where we're either intuiting or numbing awareness of being part of durational forces, um, when we're lulled by it, that's exactly when we're burnt by it. Um, there's always room for chance in high numbers. So one day Facebook writes to me, you have a memory and it's a photo of my father. And there it is, a roll of the dice. And for a moment, I'm aware of the potentiality in any photo to return with a difference. That's it. Thank you so much, Tara. That's was a beautiful and rich um, presentation. Just, just really fantastic. Um, uh, we'll go to um, Edgar um, for a little response, and then um, Tara, if you'd like to say anything after Edgar, we can do that, and then, and then we'll move through um, to discussion. So, um, Edgar, over to you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, Tara. That was a, a beautiful presentation. I don't know how can I respond to that, really. Uh, it was such a, a, a beautiful and, and deep and personal presentation, which is, if you, if you take the idea of autoethnography to the full extent, you, you definitely did that. So what I'm going to try to do, if that's okay with you, uh, so Michael, you have a task. You have to tell me when I should stop. Uh, <laughs> What I'm going to try to do is more than responding, I, I took your presentation because I didn't know what you were presenting. So I took your presentation as a, how can I put it, as a, as a stream of images. And some of the images spoke to me directly. So I'm going to try to 
create a punctum based on your presentation. And I'm not going to talk about photography, especially with Daniel Palmer in the in the room, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start by saying that you use this uh, quote from Rubinstein and, and Lewis that say, we can now truly say that we can see everything. Mm. When, I, when I read Camera Lucida for the first time, uh, many, many years ago, I just got obsessed with that image. The, the only image that he doesn't show in the book. And I, and I got so obsessed with that image, imagining it, kind of like picturing it, like, what, you know, because he gives, he provides some elements. Many years later, in one of the multiple streams that I got connected with photography, I don't know if it was Pinterest, it was Instagram, Facebook, Google, I don't know what it was. But I found an image of Roland Barthes in his studio in Paris, and behind him, there was a tiny image. Now, I just realized that that image that Barthes didn't want to show us was actually shown in that picture without mm. his consent, without actually re he realizing that somebody was taking a picture of him. It was an mm. interview or something. And mm. the picture of, of the, the famous Winter Garden picture was behind him. Mm. So I started an exploration and I read multiple blogs and stuff. And, and everybody agreed that is the photo. We actually finally saw that photo. And it was a little bit of... Um, I felt that I was betraying Bart yes. because what he did was hiding the photo in order for you to be able to see something else. Yes. By actually seeing the photo, we kind of like betray his, his idea, right? Yeah. Which, which takes me to this, um, one, of the, one, of, one of the elements in your presentation that had to do with the amount of images. You have Eric Kessel's image behind you. The, the, the amount of images that we are producing, all of us, every day. So in a way, we, it, it feels that we don't, a, a friend of mine used to say, we don't uh, photograph or living anymore. We live our lives in order to be photographed uh, mm. or to be photographing that, that mm. life. Now, as you say, you know, if you have a, a good uh, setting in the table, you, no, no, don't touch the food yet. Yeah. We need to photograph it. And, and you know, so we could, we could talk about that, which leads me to my first disclaimer, which is um, my own work has been devoted to uh, Bart in his book, he say, I'm not interested in the sociology of photography. I'm interested in the ontology of photography. I'm exactly the opposite. I'm interested in the sociology of photography. So it is very difficult to respond to your beautiful presentation because I, I, can, I kind of like move in a different direction in a way, but it was definitely interesting. Now, the second thing that I wanted to say, the second punctum that I wanted to mention in this, in this uh, cacophony of images, is um, the idea of ubiquity ovicu ovicu of photography, you know, this almost panopticon of photography that we all contribute uh, on a daily basis, taking and taking and, and uploading and sharing photographs for everything. And, and what kind of like relationship we have with, with images uh, after that? Because my feeling is that even though everything is the same, at the same time, everything has changed. And I think in, in, in my own work, I talk about the, the role of digital photography in this because the digital has shifted how we understand photography in so many different ways. So what, what you did, um, which I thought it was uh, wonderful, was to try to connect the analog photography with the digital without actually talking about the technology, but talking about the experience and talking about the almost a philosophical account of what we can do with photography. Hmm. And, and, and you mentioned the, the image of your father um, and, and we, all, we are all sorry for your loss, of course. Uh, I, I just saw on Twitter, uh, perhaps a couple of months ago, someone has uh, uploaded an, uh, a screenshot of Google, uh, uh, of Google Maps, of Google Street View, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the, the text was so beautiful because this woman, which I don't know, 
she was saying, well, my, my father used to um, love gardening, but he passed away. Mm -hmm. But now I can see him forever in Google Street View because the moment the, the little car of Google passed through his street, wow. he was actually doing gardening. Yeah. And interestingly enough, usually the, the, uh, the faces are blur, mm -hmm. but in this particular case, it wasn't. And it was just a, a very snapshot image nothing interesting photographically but for that particular woman it was a moment of encountering of remembering of living of experiencing and in, in collectively because anyone you me michael and uh, everyone could actually see that photo on google street view yeah that's beautiful which lets me which leads me to another element which is I was photographed by Google Street View very close to my home. Oh, really? And, and the fact that I, I saw the little car, and then, of course, I started looking for the photo until I found it. It, it took probably six months for Google to upload uh, the image. Mm. But now, but looking at me, looking at Google, looking at me, and that experience that is shared by everyone who's actually looking for that street. It gives you a, a different sense of yes. the space, of connections, of surveillance, of so many different things that a single image can actually trigger. Mm. Uh, Michael, do, shall I continue? <laughs> Maybe uh, another minute or two, and then, okay, um, and okay. then we'll give Tara just a, a chance. Just the last story, uh, because when you talk about um, um, your images and, and your uh, the family album, um, and getting into this sense of autoethnographic thing, my mother, she's a very um, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it, and I, and I hope like she doesn't blame me. She's a very anal person, right? <laughs> so she she keeps albums for each of her children, like by name, by year, yeah. uh, um, and all of these albums contain images. But she lives the other side of uh, of the Pacific. So she lives in, in in the Pacific coast of Mexico, and she realized a couple of um, months ago that the sunlight at some point was getting into the studio where she yeah. had all her images. Yeah. And when she opened the album, she just realized that the images were fading because of the sunlight. Yeah. And it, it was a kind of like a poetic uh, resonance because the sun, the light was actually taking away what it gave for so many years, right? Yes. So the light gave these memories and now the light is actually reclaiming those images. And I'm just going to finish with that. Thank you, Tara, again for your presentation. And thank you, Michael, for inviting me to comment on this presentation. Oh, thank you, Edgar. That, that was wonderful. There's some beautiful stories there. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I agree that um, the kind of assemblage of uh, forces and actors that are making photography move through our everyday, bringing it to us, circulating it around us and capturing us in ways that we don't have uh, necessarily a choice in the matter. Um, you know, that the fact that, you know, you don't have to be on Facebook to be on Facebook, you know, without a profile, your image is there. Um, so it is uh, a really different kind of space from which chance encounters. And certainly I'm the word encounter is right thinking about that experience of looking at the photograph and the affective forces that come up in that the awareness of time is relational and it's about all the different material forces and technological forces present so in my parents attic it's boxes and dust and all these um envelopes where the, the the photos might start to stick to each other a little bit and also I don't know the order it's not like your mother's organization of images <laughs> it's total chaos so how I experience them is quite unpredictable but then the kinds of unpredictability and chance that you encounter when this many cameras are operating in the world in 24-hour time and um, as data that is, you know, manipulated by algorithms, the the possibility to stumble on something uh, is 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 completely different. Yes. 
yeah, it takes it to the next level. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you, Edgar. And thank you, Tara. I'm sure there's lots of um, folks with questions. So um, what I'll do is um, I'll stop the live stream um, uh, and say uh, thank you um, for joining us now and in the not yet to um,